to introduce Jim Basie to you. Uh, and the, the thought that I had today was that uh, the, the world, as I perceive it, at least in this country, um, sort of the, is uh, a world in which the, the sacred and the secular are, are very, very sharply divided in the time in which we live. Uh, we have, at least publicly and visibly, we have the fundamentalists and the, you know, the Jimmy Swaggerts of this world. And uh, what are some of those other names? I can't even think of them. But uh, you know, a lot of those people, TV personalities and so on, uh, Jerry Falwells and so on, they're all sort of way over there on the right someplace. I can't really reach far enough to indicate how, <laughs> where they're at. <clears throat> but uh, you know, and then we have the rest of life. You know, somewhere over here, and there's, there used to be, uh, you know, a time when there was kind of a middle ground. Uh, there were lots of other figures that were, uh, from my standpoint, interesting. Somebody was mentioning uh, William Stringfellow here to me earlier today, and there were lots of people, Harvey Cox's, and lots of other people in the middle. There was some kind of a middle ground, but the middle ground is, is gone, almost gone, except for Jim Basic, and. <laughs> You know, in dealing with the subject of conversion, I wish that there were some way, you know, this is a very personal perspective. You may not all like it. I hope you won't take offense at it. Um, but I wish there were some way I could sick Jim Basic, you know, on a Jimmy Swagger or uh, where are those other characters, you know, on this subject of conversion. Um, I, I, I think there might be some way if we could just kind of get him a little bit more visible than he is in this room to 75 or so of us, we might have some chance of recapturing that middle ground, which I think is lost. So uh, a kind of lone figure out there in the middle ground, Jim Basie. Well, so I always feel like I need to respond to this introduction. <laughs> I have to figure out what to say about all that. I must say that, that interesting, that middle ground. I, I am going to be just uh, extemporaneous for a few minutes. I, I do um, actually feel that a lot of times. Um, not that I am there alone in the middle ground, but that uh, that's the way I perceive the the life in in the church very often. That uh, the 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 middle ground is narrowing. I feel, you know, with the rise of the religious right, and um, and on the other side, there is a, a secular world that's very strong. There's no room for religious language, no interest in the great questions and discussing those, no uh, thought that religion has any power. So, you know, in the world in which I live, there is this strong secularized consciousness, and over here, there's this other religious right and the fundamentalist groups, and I very often, I've never said this to Terry before, but feel exactly that way, as though I'm standing on an island and it's sort of getting chopped away gradually. And I, I think that that is... Uh, time to fight back. <clears throat> yeah, time to do something about that. Um, I see the thing I was talking about, Charles Curran, last week. I noticed that I was uh, quoted in the NCR as saying something about, in support of him, and... Um, in suggesting that there ought to be sort of a rising up in the United States of a response to, to try to help him out. He's the moral theologian teaching at Catholic University who is uh, under some suspicion and will be removed from his post. So with the, the, me being quoted publicly like that, I may be joining him before that. You, know? you can get a petition up for me if you want. Uh, see what you can do about it. But I'm hoping to do some more for Charlie in some way or another. <clears throat> I suppose I should try to make clear what I'm doing here and uh, so on. The, uh, my sister was here last week, told me that it was not exactly clear what I was doing and uh, that I ought to try to work on that a little bit. <laughs> so I try to take this criticism easily, you know. <clears throat> <And> <laughs> Don't tell her I said this, thing, okay? Yeah. Um, anyway, oh yes, <laughs> people work with her. Uh, please don't. Uh, I'm in enough trouble. 
Anyway, uh, I am talking about conversion here for uh, during this series of talks, and I'm doing it as a way of promoting a certain self-examination. I'm trying to find a very systematic and careful way for you and for me to look at our lives and to see what's good about it and how we might make some improvement. Now, the word conversion, as uh, Terry and I were talking about this, as suggested, is, you know, causes a lot of problems. The word conversion, especially in the United States history, has suggested something like the tent meetings and the revivals where people get together and there's a strong evangelical preacher and he, he convicts people of sin. He reminds people that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God tells us about our uh, faults and failings and our guilt and that we're no good and not worthwhile. And then after being bombarded with that and feeling pretty crummy, then comes on this message, but God saves sinners. But there's grace in the midst of all of this guilt. You can turn it around and come forward. Now, that's sort of the history of that word in the United States. It's, it suggested that kind of heavy moralizing very often. On the other hand, it is also suggested a doing a 180. That is a complete turn in life of being this terrible, crummy person and then suddenly moving totally in the opposite direction, of, moving, of being in the direction of selfishness, and now suddenly moving in the direction of goodness and love and moving towards God. So that's the other way we've used that term. Now what I've been uh, trying to get at is another way of talking about conversion, uh, a way that respects the developmental process. That is, that you and I are going through adult life cycles, that there are phases of development for us, And there are all kind of opportunities for us to make progress, to move forward. And that we are multidimensional creatures. That is, that we function in different ways. So we have an affective and emotional life. We have feelings. And it's possible for us to handle those feelings better. We have imaginations that allow us to project ourselves into the future and to bring back the past. And it's possible for us to get our imaginations to help us to be better people and closer to God. You know, we are intellectual creatures. We're people who uh, think logically and use our reason to solve problems. And it's possible as well to undergo an intellectual conversion. And as I talked about last week, we are also moral creatures. We make decisions about right and wrong. We try to follow our conscience And uh, we are able to make progress in that way as well. So we are multidimensional people who are involved in an evolutionary, developmental kind of lifestyle. And what I'm trying to do is look at that carefully and say, okay, where are we? You know, and moving from two extremes, here is uh, sort of the unconverted life, here's the converted life. Now, where am I and how might I make progress? Or as I used the image last time, sort of turning gradually and doing the 180. And as I make that gradual movement, uh, where am I now? What can I affirm about who I am and what I've been? And where is my next step if I'm going to make some sort of progress? So that's what I have been trying to talk about or deal with, conversion, turning around, a reinterpreting of that, But not just for uh, expecting people like gather in the room to here to say, let's do a 180 total turnaround. No, but where am I in that gradual turn and what is my next movement forward towards some sort of ideal? And all along, I've been trying to look at concrete examples. I'm going to um, tell you one now that was just shared to me very, very recently. And um, so I know no one has uh, heard this uh, before. Um, it is a, a gentleman was telling me about his life, rather aimless and uh, well, rather hedonistic, I guess, a lot of pleasure seeking and just drifting along and so on. And he was not uh, too sure whether there was a God or not. And it became a rather passionate interest for him. It wasn't an intellectual operation at all, like I wonder if there's a God, but he became really into it. You know, I've got to know. 
I've got to know if there's a God. I've got to know if there's some power and control over my life. And so he prayed every night for a long period of time and prayed rather strongly and uh, really got into it. And he tells me about one night when he had a tremendous experience that becomes hard to describe as all authentic religious experiences are. People never know quite what language to use in describing them. But he says it was something like this, that he was laying there in bed and it's like the roof opened up in the house. And at the same time as the roof opened up, the heavens opened up. And somehow he was engulfed by this powerful presence. And this powerful presence sort of reached inside of him and plucked out all that was evil and sinful and uh, all of the vice. And he had this uh, overwhelming feeling that this powerful presence knew him by name. And that was his exact words, that he was known by name by this powerful presence. And in fact, this presence knew everybody by name and was sort of intimately connected with all human beings. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you know, that I will never forget that. And for this man, it was many years ago. He says, I will never forget that experience. He said, I haven't lived up to it all the time. In many ways, I've failed. In many ways, I've been fa- have not uh, been true to the insight of that particular experience. But I have never forgotten it, and I've never denied it. It's uh, interesting to me, uh, that uh, kind of experience that he describes. It re- represents for me now something of what I'm going to call this religious conversion. Because when we move to religious conversion, now it's sort of a, a deeper, more central kind of conversion in life than our emotional and our imaginative and our intellectual and moral conversions. Now it has to do with the whole person responding positively to the mystery that is around us. No, it somehow means a decision, as all conversions, I think, eventually involve a decision to hand one's life over to a power that's greater than oneself. It is to begin to live, at least ideally, in a new way, as a person of faith that has some sort of a conviction that there is a goal out there in front of us and that we ought to be moving towards it. No, it is to live as a person of charity, to be in love, to fall in love. Bernard Lonergan, a very, um, shall I say, staid, careful, systematic theologian, talked about religious conversion as falling in love with God, a falling in love with God, so that one sort of lets down the final barriers or one opens one's heart to a greater degree, or one hands one's being over, and therefore tries to live in one way or another this law of love, a love that appreciates the goal for what it is, not just to what we can get out of it. So the person who would be religiously converted would probably no longer just always pray, please give health to my children, or bless my wife, or help me in my career, so that there would be a benevolence about this. There would be an appreciation of the goal as being worthwhile in itself, as being something that would pull us forward, allure us. You know, sexual language seems to begin to make sense when one talks about falling in love with God. Much of the scriptural language is like that. So God is like the faithful lover. God is the one who's alluring, enticing, you know, somehow connecting in with what's in the very center of our being, with that deep longing we have for closeness, for intimacy, uh, to be a part of, to be joined to, to become two, united, one, all of that. It has a, a, a very strong, passionate kind of character. The one is now passionate in a sense for the deity. It means to be a person of hope so that uh, we are now are trusting in this uh, goal, that we sense that we are growing out of some source that's bigger and stronger than we are, that the mystery that surrounds us is indeed gracious, 
and trustworthy, that the whole process of life can be trusted. You know, that if I did let go and made this decision to um, surrender to this powerful mystery that I would fall into gracious hands. It would be all right with me. Uh, it would be okay. So all of that is to say something about what I mean by this religious conversion. This is the most central kind of conversion. It focuses all the other things. Maybe summarized in that statement, it is a falling in love with God. Now we can talk about the same thing in Christian terms because religious conversions usually are not just um, general things. They usually connect in somehow with a tradition, you know, so we could talk about a Buddhist religious conversion you know, or a, a Muslim converting their lives uh, to Allah. And in Christian terms, of course, we like to talk about this in terms of a conversion to Jesus Christ so that the religious conversion gets focused. It's not just this general thing of I will fall in love with the mystery that surrounds us, but that that mystery has manifested itself in Jesus Christ and that therefore religious conversions means that I dedicate myself to Christ. I'm committed to Christ. Now he becomes for me the final prophet and the absolute savior, uh, the one who is most important of all, who has the key to life. The great rule with this then becomes be a loving person. The decision becomes, I will be a passionate, loving person to the mystery and to all the people who reflect this mystery. Again, the examples I've used throughout have been polarized conversions. So the guy's laying there in bed. He doesn't know if there's a God or not. And then he prays and he's now no longer doubting this and has never doubted it for 40 years after the experience. However, uh, we don't want to let that put us off because what the question becomes, it seems to me for us, what is the intensity of the passion with which I have fallen in love with the mystery? You know, what is the degree to which I have committed myself to the mystery that surrounds us? To what degree do I have the goal in mind as I walk the path of life? So most people who gather for a session like this are not going to be saying, you know, I'm an athe atheist or I'm an agnostic, although some might, but for people who are believing, the call is to say, what is the next step? What's the next barrier in this love process that's supposed to fall? I sometimes have the image of myself being on the edge of a water and sort of uh, touching into it and uh, testing that water. It's always a question, is one going to jump completely or not? Or do we hold something back? You know, is there some part of my life that I'm being called to sort of surrender or hand over or whatever uh, word you want to use for that? And... Uh, there is, it seems to me that there's that testing and wondering, will I make the next step or not? I, perhaps people can get into that and say, you know, well, what, what's that next step for me? What would it be like? Okay, as I've been trying to do, let me try to specify this general religious uh, conversion here and begin to see what parts make it up, to analyze it a little bit. So first of all, I would say this religious conversion amounts to a movement from a situation in which mystery is eclipsed for us to sort of an abiding awareness of the gracious mystery that surrounds us. Now, to be living in an eclipse of mystery means we're living rather superficially, that we're curious about many things, that we don't really have a way of talking or dealing with the great human realities. So we're not able to deal well with death or freedom or love or human sexuality. So that uh, these things become uh, sort of put into a zone of silence so that one doesn't really know what to say upon a death, what to do or how to act with friends or loved ones who have uh, gone through a death. 
mystery becomes eclipsed because there's no language to resurrect it. In other words, one goes about one's business and uh, one is simply uh, functioning and there's other bills to pay, you know, and beds to make and meals to cook and all kind of other stuff to be done and the deeper dimensions of life that have to do with love and freedom and personal relationships and whatever it is we refer to when we use that word God simply is lost. It's eclipsed. It's not that it isn't there, but it's shadowed. It's over, it's, uh, we, we don't get in touch with it. It's lost to us. Now, to be a person of, uh, who is converted here means now we become attuned to the signals of the mystery around us. We don't expect it to come down while we're laying there in bed and open up the ceiling for us. But what we are doing is being in tune with all the little manifestations around, all the clues to its existence. So the world begins to look different. It's like Teilhard de Chardin said, world's divided into two kinds of people, those who see and those who don't. Those who see and those who don't. The people who see get beneath the surface of things. Instead of flitting around all the time, superficially, here and there, superficial relationships, superficial study, you know, superficial attempt to deal with our emotions, now one sees into the depths. One sees that there's more to life than simply all these trivial things that command our attention. One begins, for example, to see in people now, something that I didn't recognize before. So one who is attuned to this probably would not say, I can read her like a book. Well, probably wouldn't say that because he would recognize that there's something mysterious about human beings, something deeper that can't be rationally calculated, that people have a development, that they be, do new and surprising things. There's depths there that we never dreamt were there. To be religiously converted seems to me to be in tune with that, to almost make a decision that I won't stereotype and categorize too soon. I'll let the mysterious element of the other come out. That's somewhat, I think, of what it means to say that we are attuned to the mystery. We begin to see God in all things, in the sunshine and maybe in the rain as well, in my virtuous moments, at times when I'm really terrific and with it and act nobly, and also in my sinful moments of failure. That all of those things point me to the, je the gracious mystery, all clues to the presence of God, even the negative, even the failures, even the sins. Now, you know, how are we going to get there? You know, how are we going to move forward in that way? I, I think our personal relationships are a good place to start. It might be helpful to try to listen carefully to people, to give people a chance, don't stereotype too soon, Try to have deeper conversations with people. Allow people to share their feelings. We try to share our feelings as well. Let's talk about the things that are really important. You know, let's uh, watch an important film together and talk about it. Let's turn the TV off after a significant TV program and discuss it for a while. All kinds of ways we can begin to attune ourselves. Maybe for some people it means reading poetry. Other people it might mean reading scriptures. But we're trying to sharpen our angle of vision so we begin to see the mystery dimension that is present but so easily eclipsed. Second way I would try to examine this is that it's a movement from a life in which we drift to a passionate drive for holiness. Now, we might have to change some of those words to really get at what I'm talking about, but the drifting we probably all recognize. You know, that's to go to wake up someday and to say, you know, my heavens, I haven't uh, really made any progress in my life for a whole year. Or I still pray now the way I prayed when I was in high school. Or I still attend religious services with the same mindset as I did 20 years ago. It is to say that we are drifting, that we haven't taken hold, that we've made no effort to improve ourselves, that we haven't responded to the gifts of grace around us. That would be one of the sadder things in life, to wake up in old age and say, I never took hold. Well, I never did anything to try to improve myself. I never 
examine myself. I never dealt with the important questions. I never wrestled with the mysteries of life. I've never shared with another human being in depth. I've never revealed what's in my mind and heart to another human being. That is to say that I have drifted. I've made no progress. I haven't gotten rid of any faults. I'm not any more responsible or noble of character than I was before. To be converted seems to me to be to decide that I'm going to be passionate about holiness. Now the word holiness I think puts many people off because we think of plaster saints or people apart from the world or people who uh, don't have the same kind of struggles. But I would mean a, a passion for holiness would mean a drive to come closer to God to become more integrated, to get the parts of my personality and character that are out of sync with my fundamental option or my general orientation for good, to get those parts of me, whatever they are, into sync with this fundamental option. I want to begin to say those, those parts of me that don't seem to fit, that I'm not happy with, to look at those and to bring them into the light of consciousness and to make some systematic efforts to improve along that line. So the quest for holiness is a quest somehow for integration. It is a quest also to learn a greater dependency upon the mystery, to learn that I am indeed not autonomous, that I don't control it all myself, that I am indeed dependent. Again, our failures would be most revealing here. To be a person of holiness means that when we fail, we don't think the end of the world comes, that we, that we are able, we have something to fall back on. There's something to fall back on when we reach our own limitations. And what we're falling back on is finally this source of all that we are, which we call God. To be a moving towards holiness means that we recognize the true source of our joy in life and that we are grateful for all of that, that we realize that all of those things are gifts from this mystery that surrounds us. So holiness can be described in many ways, but it has to do with being close to God, learning a proper dependency in life. No, it has to do with letting go and achieving a greater integration. Again, what we might try to do with that in trying to deal with this holiness, how are we going to move in that direction I think sort of a periodic examination of conscience is helpful. Something like we're doing throughout this whole series where one uh, can sort of check it out. You know, in my own Catholic tradition, we have that idea of confession or sacrament of reconciliation. You know, I like to go uh, do that during the Lenten time as we get closer to Easter and sort of make it a comprehensive uh, statement of one's life to look at it as a whole and to say, how are my relationships going with God and with those that I love most and with those that I serve? and with the, my relationship with myself, in a sense, sort of a comprehensive view of where I stand. Maybe that's what people do on retreats or when they walk in the woods and get, and get away from the job for a while. But wherever one's format and however one chooses to ritualize that, it does seem crucial that we do that kind of examination somewhere along the line. Next uh, thing, way I would say this is that it is a movement, this religious conversion, from being half-hearted about one's religious tradition to being whole-hearted about it. Half-hearted person grows up in a faith and says, yeah, that's where it is, that's what my mother and father taught me, I sort of try to keep up with it in one way or another, I go to church and uh, now and then I say a prayer, and, uh, but it, you know, it is not at the center of one's being. One is half hearted about it. It doesn't touch in with one's business life, what one does at the office or what it's like out on the golf course. It has nothing to do with any of that. It functions half-heartedly in intensity and in its scope it's very narrow. To be wholehearted about one's religious tradition means that one drinks it in now. One takes that whole symbol system or that whole interpretive scheme that one maybe got from one's folks and says, okay, I'm going to make that mine now. That's going to be my way of dealing with the world. 
That's going to be my way of understanding what's going on in my life. It's the stories out of that tradition which I will now let shape me. So that when one makes decisions about the business world, that one would say it's the story of Jesus that guides me. That really, when I make decisions about family life, about finances, uh, when I am involved in recreation, that even at those times, the story of Jesus impinges on me. That uh, the principles that he taught somehow become real to me. They take me over. That's what it would mean to be wholehearted. That the extent of it would be to govern all aspects of my life. You know, I told you about that dialogue, the Christian-Muslim dialogue. And what came through to me so clearly about the, the Muslims is that religion is not a part of their life, it's everything. 